and welcome to Chapter 3 of Conceptual Physics 12th Edition by Hewitt. In this chapter, we're going to discuss linear motion and really introduce the terminology of motion, namely velocity and acceleration, which will apply to many other fields of physics. Okay, so a couple of key ideas and topics. Motion is relative. What is speed? What is velocity? And how does it differ from speed? How do we define acceleration? Why is free fall matter? And let's go back to vectors, which we introduced in the previous chapter and lecture. Okay? All right. So what does it mean that motion is relative? Well, the motion of objects is always described as relative to something else. There's no such thing as absolute motion. For example, you walk on the road relative to the Earth, but Earth is moving relative to the sun. So if you have one speed, I mentioned speed because we've seen um, that idea a bit more than velocity so far. So if you have one speed relative to the road, say two miles per hour or three miles per hour, you have a very different speed relative to the sun, thousands of miles per hour, right? So your motion relative to the sun is different from your motion relative to earth, right? Quite different. So then we, have, we would have a motion relative to the center of the galaxy, a motion relative to other galaxies, if we're thinking very big picture. There's just no such thing as absolute motion. And of course, the key idea of that is because this space itself, in fact, space-time itself is expanding. There's nothing at rest in this entire universe that we know of. Okay, so big ideas aside, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. What is speed, okay? So the actual definition of speed is that it is defined as a distance covered per amount of travel time. Okay, so it's distance per time, simply that. The units are meters per second. What those often look like, parenthetically, are m over s, just like that. In equation form, it is speed is just distance over time. Notice it is distance over time, okay? So a distance is your how, how much you've changed total, right? So if I walk five feet in front of me or five meters in front of me, and then I walk five meters back the other way, my distance would be 10 meters, okay? Because even, even though I maybe ended up where I started, because I walked five meters forward and then five meters back, I still have a non-zero distance, right? That's a key attribute of what we in physics define as distance. Time is just time, right? Measured in seconds. Example, a girl runs four meters in two seconds, her speed is two meters per second, okay? All right. So, what is average speed? Well, it's just the average. It is the total distance covered divided by the total, total time traveled. It is different from instantaneous speed, more than just a second. It doesn't um, indicate various instantaneous speeds along the way. It's not about average, averaging instantaneous speeds along the way. It is simply looking at total distance and dividing by total time, okay? That's all it is. So, when you are driving your car and you look at your speedometer, that is not average speed, right? Not, not at all. In fact, average speed would be, would be calculated not with your speedometer at all, but instead with your odometer and a stopwatch of some sort. Because then you know exactly how, how much distance has been covered and you know how long it took. And that would give you your average speed. You'd have to calculate it, okay? But your instantaneous speed is given by your speedometer. Okay? And we have an example here you can take a look at. All right, let's do a check. All right, so the average speed of driving 30 kilometers in one hour is the same as the average speed of driving. Okay, you just might have to make sure the total distance over time gives you the same numerical answer. Okay, pause the video and make sure you can do it. All right, 60 and 2, because we just multiplied both by 2. Both the, we multiplied the denominator and the numerator by 2, therefore the result was the same. Okay, and that's summarized down here in the explanation. Okay, so instantaneous speed is the speed at any instant. Example, when you ride in your car, you may speed up and slow down um, with speed at any instant that is normally quite different than your average speed. Okay, I mentioned that before. All right, so now on velocity. Now, I make a big deal about this transition because velocity is definitely more relevant. A lot of the things that we care about, like circular motion, understanding gravity and satellites and orbits, um, even moving on to momentum and collisions of objects, so many things are going to be worked out going to make sense in the context of Newton's laws and the context of conservation laws, such as momentum and energy, if we consider velocity rather than speed, okay? Now, velocity is a vector mentioned in the previous chapter. Okay, so a description of both the instantaneous speed of the object and the direction of travel, that's what makes it a vector, okay? That's magnitude and direction, 
okay? In fact, it's magnitude of speed. So speed is half the information that is included in velocity. All right, so constant speed is steady speed, neither speeding up nor slowing down. Constant velocity is constant speed and constant direction. So you think about it, constant velocity is much more restrictive. In order to have constant velocity, you can't be turning. I could be keeping a constant speed of 10 meters per second, but if I'm going through a curve at a constant speed, well, my velocity is non-constant, right? Okay, and that's definitely something that you have to wrap your head around. It may, it may be, it be immediately obvious, but if not, right, look, look at the diagrams in the book. We'll have some, um, some more chance to discuss that when we talk about circular motion. But make sure you understand that idea that turning is not constant velocity, okay? All right, and then as far as the relative nature of velocity, we're not going to state that in every problem. You know, if I talk about you know, a, a, a ball falling through the air at five meters per second, we don't have to assume that that is relative to Earth. It's not, the, or we should assume it's relative to Earth. It won't be stated in the problem. Okay, so now acceleration. Other than mentioning um, previously that it was a vector, we really haven't defined it at all. So let's make sure we define it carefully, all right? So the formulation by Galileo back in the 1500s, based on his experiments of inclined planes, um, it is the rate at which velocity changes over time. Okay, so velocity is the rate at which displacement changes over time, then acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes over time. Okay, so acceleration can involve a change in speed or, no, it's not and, a change in direction or both. All right. So this car, if it's making a turn at constant speed, would still be accelerating. Okay. We would know that acceleration and more on this when we talk about forces, we would know that acceleration because we would feel a apparent force that's throwing us to one side of the car. We know that when you make a turn, you kind of feel like you're being thrown to one side. Okay. To the outside of the turn. And that's because of inertia. Okay because you want to continue moving in the direction, something has to stop you. Well, you know, there's nothing to stop your shoulders from sliding off in the direction that inertia is going to allow them to go in, that property of matter, okay? Objects will stay in motion unless acted on by an external force, okay? Or stay at rest. Now, you could also go through this turn and speed up, right? You could have non-constant speed. And then you'd have two forms of acceleration. You would have some acceleration into the turn, and then you might also have acceleration tangential or in the direction of your motion, okay? Tangential just means at the immediate direction you're going. So both cases there's acceleration, in some cases there's just more acceleration, all right? So the form of the equation for acceleration is just change in velocity over time interval, all right? So it looks kind of like average speed or something, right? Or even the definition of velocity, which would be change in displacement. Um, and just to um, be clear on that, I wanna write this up here, that velocity is change in displacement. And I'm calling attention to this because I wanna highlight the difference between the word displacement versus the word distance, time interval. And this would all be an average if there's some time interval. If your time interval is not incredibly small, then it's really not instantaneous, is it? Or even an approximation of instantaneous. It's an average, right? Averaging over that time interval. But that word displacement right here, that refers to your final location um, minus your initial location, okay? So it's just final location minus initial. That's different than distance because again, your distance could be non-zero even though your final location is exactly equal to your initial location, in which case displacement would be zero, right? Because if I had x final equals x initial, f for final, i for initial, well, that's going to give me a displacement of zero. But again, to reiterate, it would not give me a distance of zero, okay? Because I could have gone somewhere and come back, and so I would, I would still have covered some distance, but I would have a displacement that is zero and a distance that is non-zero, okay? All right, so that's a bit, bit of a kind of going back to um, previous stuff, but I want to make sure that I clarified that before we continue on discussing acceleration. Okay, so the unit of acceleration is unit of velocity over unit of time. Okay, well, think about that then. Well, velocity is meters per second and time is just seconds. So that means that the units are going to be meters per second per second, okay? 
a little bit of algebra, that becomes meters per second times second. Okay, think about dividing by dividing by, which is the same as, and this would be in the parentheses, which is the same as meters per second squared. Okay, all right. So your car's speed may be um, presently 40 kilometers an hour. Your car's speed five seconds later is 45. Then your change is five kilometers per hour. And then your acceleration is one kilometer per hour per second, right? Well, that's really clunky, right? So that's why we prefer to express it in meters per second squared. Okay, when we talk about the most important acceleration on Earth, which is gravitational acceleration, you're always going to see it as 9.8 or approximately 10 meters per second squared. Okay, the second squared is in the denominator. All right, quick check. An automobile is accelerating when it is, okay? Make sure you can confidently answer this. Refer back, pause, make sure you're, you're, you're absolutely sure. Both, okay? Both when it's slowing down to a stop, just in a straight line, or when it's rounding a curve at a steady speed. Those are both forms of acceleration, okay? So a change in speed or a change in direction, or both, right? So it could be slowing down into a turn or speeding up out of a turn, okay? But if it's either or, it's an acceleration. All right, I think you get it. Okay, acceleration and velocity are actually, look at your options, what's the best answer? Pause if you need a moment. Rates, but for different quantities, okay? They're both rates of change. One is a rate of change of displacement. The other is a rate of change of velocity. Okay? All right. So, back to Galileo, right? So, because Galileo laid the framework of what the modern understanding of acceleration is, so it makes sense to refer to where it all started. Galileo increased the inclination of inclined planes. Steeper inclines resulted in greater acceleration. That seems like common sense, doesn't it? When the incline is vertical, acceleration is at a maximum, okay? A maximum on the surface of Earth. The same as that as a falling object, because it's just going straight down, right? There's no friction here, and it's just going, if it's going straight down that path, it might as well just have no path at all. It might as well just be free fall. When air resistance is negligible, all objects fall with the same unchanging acceleration, okay? The acceleration of gravity, but we'll come back to that. Okay, so falling under the influence of gravity only, that's with negligible air resistance, which is just so little it doesn't matter, all right? So that is considered free fall. That's what we call free fall. Anytime you're falling under the influence of gravity. Now, an important thing, you don't need to be moving down to be falling. If I throw an object up, right? If I take an object in my hand right now, maybe you have something nearby, grab something, give it a toss up in the air. From the moment it leaves your hand, it's falling, right? Because look, it is under the influence of gravity only. Once it's in the air, the only thing influencing it is gravity once it leaves your hand. So sure, it's still moving up for a while because you gave it an initial upward velocity, but it's falling on the way up, it's falling at the top of the toss where it's momentarily at rest, and it's falling on the way down, okay? So the entire time it's in free fall, it just happens to have some leftover initial velocity moving up for the first moment, okay? So freely falling objects on Earth accelerate at a rate of 10 meters per second, second, right? 10 meters per second, second. 10 meters per second squared. That's good. That's the way we tend to use the unit. More precisely, 9.8. Okay? So definitely you want to, unless specified otherwise, use 9.8. Right? Unless I tell you to round, use 9.8. All right. So the velocity acquired by an object starting from rest is velocity equals acceleration times time. Okay? Now, why does that work? Well, think about it, right? Think about the definition of acceleration. So velocity... We were told that acceleration by definition is change in velocity, which is, has the same units as velocity over time. So then if I multiply by time, well, look what happens. The time in the denominator of the definition of velocity, right, because it's just acceleration, this part right here. That's just acceleration. Well, that time from the definition cancels with the time that we're multiplying by. So we just get back to a velocity. So if I drop an object, for example, and I let it fall for a certain number of seconds, and I know at what rate it's accelerating, right, it's falling, say 9.8 meters per second squared, right, free fall acceleration, then I know how fast it's going after that elapsed time. So you can easily find how fast something is going in free fall. Let's look at another example. So under free fall, an acceleration is 10 meters per second squared, so rounding in this case. The speed is 10 meters per second after one second, right, because we'd have 10 times one, 20 meters per second after two seconds, because we'd have 10 times two, 30 meters per second after three seconds, because in that case, it would be 10 times three for 30, and so on, right? So that means it speeds up 
10 meters per second every second of free fall. All right, you get it? So since it's speeding up, that means it can't be covering the same amount of distance per second, right? So that means it covers less distance in the first second, a little bit more distance in, in the second second, even more distance in the third second, right? So each of these in this picture is a second of free fall. And look, they get larger because of course they do, because the velocity is growing, because the acceleration is non-zero. All right, pretty cool, huh? So at a particular instant, a free falling object has a speed of 30 meters per second. Exactly one second later, its speed will be, okay, look at your options, make sure you can answer it, pause if you need to, more than 35. In fact, it'll be about 40, okay? All right, if you round 10, it's exactly 40. The distance covered by an accelerating object starting from rest is distance equals one half times acceleration times time times time. So this, this bit here is time squared, okay? So that relates to the total distance of free fall. So that would be represented in this picture here, right? This is the distance we're referring to. This is our D, right? So if I want to find out how much vertical distance has been covered by an object that was dropped from rest off the edge of a cliff, for example, then I would use that formula, okay? And so what it could look like in equation form would be one half times A for acceleration times time squared, okay? And in words, it's like in the blue box. Under free fall, when acceleration is 10 meters per second squared, the, um, the reversible error, five um, meters per second after one second, the um, 20 meters per second after two seconds, and 45 meters after three seconds, and so on, okay? So what you have there is you have a growth that is non-steady. You only cover five meters in that first second, you know, four times as much in the second second, and then, you know, seven times as much, um, or excuse me, nine times as much in that third second, right? So significant, you know, you're, you're covering a lot more ground as you fall, all right? Now, in the real world, you reach terminal velocity, which we'll discuss briefly, at least on Earth, right? Um, so you, at some rate, at some point, you stop accelerating, but in the vacuum or a planet with very little atmosphere, then you just continue to accelerate, all right? So what is the distance fallen after four seconds for a freely falling object starting from rest? Use the equation. Use the D equals one half times A times T squared. Okay, make sure you can put in your calculator and get that answer. All right, everybody do that one. Yep, 80 meters. Okay, cool. All right, there's the, there's the work right there. Okay, so a little bit more about velocity vectors. So we introduced the idea of vectors using the Pythagorean theorem. Talked about how that might apply to something like forces. It will actually get back to doing more concrete examples of forces. But let's, let's do one right now, right? Let's make sure we can use the Pythagorean theorem with a vector that is not pointing at a, on a straight line, okay? So here we have a 60 kilometer per hour crosswind, right? So that is a velocity. And it um, blows the 80 kilometer per hour airplane off course at 100 kilometers per hour. If the crosswind were 80 kilometers per hour, the airplane would travel at 130, 113 kilometers per hour at an angle of what, okay? So again, you don't have to do the angle, you just have to think about what's going on. I'm not asking you to exactly you know, do the trig function here. You just have to estimate based on the Pythagorean theorem and right triangles, okay? So let's take a look at this. So we have the 60 kilometer crosswind, so that's right here, that's the crosswind, right, blowing in towards the west, okay? The 80 kilometers is the speed of the plane. That would be the speed of the plane relative to the wind. Okay? And so then the result is 100 kilometers per hour. Okay? If the crosswind were 80 kilometers per hour, the plane, the plane would travel at 113 kilometers per hour. Okay? So we'd have, we'd have a greater, you know, a basically what would be happening then, right? Well, let's think, right? That means that this, this value becomes 80. That has lengthened this vector, the thicker blue vector, so it's now it's like longer and over here, and has made this angle smaller, right? The right triangle has got more stretched out in the horizontal, right? So the angle has become less, okay? Now the angle wasn't 45 to begin with, was it, right? So let's, but let's think, right? Initially the angle was what? Was it greater than or equal to 45? Well, it was greater than 45, right? Because before the triangle was, was such a way, not, Excuse me. Sorry, I accidentally showed you the, um, the solution there. My bad. The before the angle was like this, and it was greater than 45, right? Because these, the sides of the triangle were not equal to each other. 80 was larger than 60. So the triangle was elongated in the vertical. But when we make the wind 80, 
thus making the hypotenuse 113, which we don't really need that value. Well, now both sides of the triangle actually are equal. So that means the angle now is exactly 45 degrees since I already showed you the solution, okay? So that's the idea there. That's the idea of right triangles and then you'll have more chance to practice it, okay? All right, the parallelogram would then be a square. The parallelogram is this one here, right? Here it's a rectangle, but if we make the wind 80, then all the sides are equal, thus it's a square, okay? All right, and the angle that crosses that square from vertex to vertex is 45 degrees. Okay, you run horizontally at four meters per second in a vertically falling rain that falls at four meters per second. Relative to you, the raindrops are falling at an angle of what? Okay, think about the parallelogram, think about the velocities, how do they relate to each other? Okay, make sure this one makes sense to you. All right, everyone have an answer? Pause if you need to. It's 45 degrees again because both the velocities are the same, right? You're running at four meters per second. The rain is coming down at four meters per second. Those sides of the triangle are equal to each other. Thus, the rain relative to you is simply going to be the square root of four squared plus four squared meters per second, all right? Which would be the square root of 32 meters per second. So whatever, whatever the square root of 32 meters per second is, if you plug it in your calculator as a decimal, is going to be the, um, the velocity. And in fact, here it is, 46, okay? Or sorry, 5.6, I don't know why I said 46. And this right here is that 45 degree angle. Okay, that's the idea. That's what you need to know, okay? And again, you don't need to calculate the angles. You just need to relate them to whether it is, you know, equal sides or is it elongated one way or another. All right, that's it. We defined speed and velocity. We defined acceleration, and we got a little bit more practice of vectors, which we're going to see again in the very next lecture, which will be in, um, in the next video, okay? Thank you so much for listening. I hope this has uh, been interesting and uh, we can continue into exploring physics.